Is that cool? Yep, recording has begun. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the April 27th version of our weekly community call. So happy to see all your faces and your avatars staring back at me. It's wonderful. It makes my day, makes my day better for sure. Um, Sean has kindly posted the minutes and agenda in the chat. Uh, so if you would be so kind as to add your name if you feel like it and let us know how you're doing, that would be great. Uh, I will add my name here. There's an empty slot here. Welcome, Matthew. Hello, Matthew. Not to put you on the spot, but hello. Hi, everyone. We're glad you're here. It's nice to be here. I already feel like I know some of you from the podcast. I'll just say that. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I was very happy for your email. Thank you for sending that. Matthew has also made an appearance on our mailing list, so you may recognize that name from that as well. If you're subscribed to the mailing list, and if you're not, you absolutely should be. So you should go do that right now. Not we're right gonna now. Have to have, we're going to have to have the uh, Matt, Matthew, like, have you yeah. seen the one, like, the Josh throwdown? in the Nebraska <laughs> cornfield. <laughs> Do something similar here. <laughs> Who gets to wear the crown? We'll have to That's find right. out. Stay tuned. Uh, OK, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we jump into the agenda, I just want to take a minute and check in with our folks who are in India or have friends and family in India. Uh, I just want to check in with you if you feel like letting us know how you're doing. I'm just really super concerned about you, and I want to know if there's something we can do to help you. I don't know what that would be, but if there is something, we're here for you. So if anyone wants to jump in and let us know how you're doing, that would be great. Uh, hello. Am I audible? Hi, yeah, currently I'm staying in my university campus and uh, our semester is over. So the university is forcing us to go to homes. But uh, for now, there is no problem in my home. Everyone is healthy. Really good to hear that. Hello, everyone. Hi, Ash. Hello. So apparently in my city, the situation is quite bad. And like we are getting exponential rise in the corona cases. Um, scientific models do predict that we'll have a peak around 15th of May, but let's hope. The earlier it goes, the better. Is there anything we can do to support you, Yash? Not particularly, I think, but thanks for asking. Okay, well, if you think of something, please let me know, okay? Because our community is here for you. Thank you. Anyone else have family there, friends? Okay, well, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, but again, if you all think of anything, if we can support you in any way, let us know for sure, because we're here to do that. Um, jumping ahead to our, we did a super scientific Twitter poll last week, um, just to kind of ask our community like how we can help you and what you're struggling with because we just wanted to find out what their pain points were. So we had a bunch of great ideas last week of which I could implement very few of them because <laughs> the Twitter polls are very limited uh, to 25 characters and four responses. So I had to kind of do my best to, uh, you know, be concise. But anyway, so this, I, I dropped a, a link um, or a, a screenshot of what the results were. Um, in the minutes there. So um, I don't know if we want to take a minute and talk about it. It's kind of interesting, I think. Do we want to, I can share my screen if, if we want, or somebody can. I don't know if I can. Oh. Oh. There it is. I have a question. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. Did, was there any verbal responses or? like more details shared or something like that. Like seeing, knowing what data to get and kind of, I guess the first question I have is, so like what kind of data are you looking for? <laughs> I think that, yeah, I, I think that the way it read 
to me, which is clearly biased. Um, but I, you know, I think it's just not even knowing where to start and not knowing how to get any data that would answer questions that are on your mind or even what data there could be out there. I think um, there's a little ambiguity between uh, interpreting the data and using data to make change. Um, so that I think it might be that some people um, understood those things to mean roughly the same thing. And so the, um, the results arguably could be 13% plus 30% for the problem being about you know, putting the data to use, finding insights and doing things that are actionable. And I can say that um, in, in our um, group at Merico, we're thinking about a lot and I'm thinking about a lot. You know, how do you, how, how do you like what do maintainers want? What are they seeking to do? What are their um, practical needs uh, that can be served by uh, data? Uh, I, I agree with Lucas, and I, I think further that that first question, the knowing what data to get, could probably be split into two as well, I, because uh, I think it, it it could be interpreted as uh, knowing what questions to ask, uh, and then and then also the specific metrics that can connect to those questions. So yesterday on a podcast that's not released, it was myself and Elizabeth and Sophia and Don and Georg. And we were talking about the podcast itself. So it's a meta podcast, I guess. But one of the things that we talked about um, was in the chaos project that we're kind of at this point I think it was you that brought it up, Sophia, kind of at this point, you know, where we've done a lot of the work to start to um, articulate the metrics. You know, we have whatever, 60 some odd metrics and connecting them to tooling, but really at that point now where we as a community might want to start helping people <laughs> through, through that first part. So we have all the tools in place and like helping people know what data to get. I think we're doing this, right? So for example, in the DNI badging program, we're helping people know what data to get with respect to event badging. You know, it's not perfect, but it's helping people. Um, so you know, I, maybe because the data is so evenly split, like what am I saying, like 33, 24, 13, 30, like there's nothing that like, it's like, oh my gosh, this is the this is the thing. This is the one thing. So maybe as a community, we start thinking about how we can help overcoming each one of these, whether it's to Lucas's point, like the end of the chain, right? Interpreting the data and then putting it to, to use, or to Kevin's point, like even knowing what questions to ask and then subsequently what data to get, and then obviously collecting the data. So it just it to me, this just reinforces what we talked about yesterday in the podcast that nobody's heard, um, that we're in this spot of, of maybe thinking about how we can be more deliberate in helping people through, through this phase, because we have a lot of good, good pieces in place. Sophia, did I collect that or get that right? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also, I guess we kind of touched on this in tooling, but say like knowing what data to get, some of our metrics are more or less specific about sourcing in terms of where we're actually extracting data from and the tools could be platform specific, but I'm also wondering if that's the, the top selection, then maybe it would behoove us to sort of aggregate all the sources that we use or just are common in use. I mean, maybe that's overkill, but I, I know at least the more I learn about existing research in this space, the more I can 
uncover other kinds of data sources. And depending on what your needs are, there's sort of the alignment between what source makes the most sense to answer your question. Um, but like most of the time people are using GitHub, but there's more than that. <laughs> so yep. maybe it might be worthwhile to have just sort of like, these are the top five sources that programs are using to answer these kinds of questions. And maybe, I feel like it's a lot of like, might be, feels like a bit foundational. Um, and it's sort of like a lot more specific than a lot of what our metrics currently do today. I think they're a lot more general and generalized on purpose so that we're not platform specific or data source specific. Um, but if the challenge is an implementation, then the first question is where do you get data from? <laughs> so if it's sort of like a, these are the things that we use or other programs have used and then provide direct links to their documentation and their APIs and tools that work with them. I mean, I think it's, I don't know how useful that is. I think it would be useful for some folks that are brand new to stuff like this. Um, but that's kind of how I interpret how we could make it sort of, I mean, I think there are many things we could do to make this more usable, but that's sort of the first thing. Um, and just in terms of where you start. One, and I think there's an sort of a, a orthogonal or sideways perspective on where you knowing what data to get. Do you, there's, assume you have a platform, whatever it is, should I be looking at issues? Should I be looking at pull requests, commits? These, these are questions that, that often come up. And the ones that have been most commonly requested from Augur at least are focused on new contributors, retention of new contributors, uh, lag time associated with pull request creation and, and merging. Um, so these are, I think, indicators that people are using to determine if they're doing the things they need to do to grow or that we think they need to do to retain um, healthy engagement from their community. And that could, you know, so what platform that comes from is a, a different factor. So was your Sean like, was it mapping a little bit of what's the, like what you can get from GitHub? It's and mapping you, more to what kinds of, you know, step back, what are your goals? Um, and for, for groups whose goal is to attract and retain contributors, there's a, few, there's a few kinds of reports that have been requested or used fairly often. New contributor retention and pull request responsiveness is one, issue responsiveness is another. So these are all things that are, I think, parts of metrics that we produce. So we have these 60 metrics, but when people have a goal um, of sustaining their community or uh, they tend to go after the, the sort of collection of metrics I'm, just, I'm describing, which is different than, and I think we, I don't know that we do, a, I don't know that we explain well enough, like sort of what some people are doing or what some of the case studies are. But I think that could be helpful for a newcomer. I think it, looking at the metrics at an atomic level is hard for a person to process. It's like getting a dictionary and trying to learn how to speak a language. I'm in listening to the conversation. Um, it feels like a couple of things, M Matt. You brought up in an earlier meeting or discussion, um, the use of, and I'm not sure if this was the exact terminology, but user scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like, yeah, I, I, I love that idea. Um, just me personally, because, you know, so, someone who's coming in who is new to the body of work created by the Chaos Project team, um, who like, okay, where do I start? Um, these user scenarios, it feels like would be helpful. Okay, you know, and, and start with, the objective, do you want to retain and grow, you know, 
your contributor base? Do you want to, you know, what's your, what's your objective, Let, you know, and, and walk through the user scenario and here's, and, and then pull from the body of work, here's what would be useful and, and kind of, you know, maybe prescribe is too strong a word, but kind of walk through what you would use, where you would, you know, fr from, from what's been created. And then on the flip side, um, or, or, or in addition to that, maybe there are some actual case studies of others who have uh, succeeded and, and, and what they have done. So kind of the user scenarios, and then also the case studies. I just, those mm -hmm. two things came to mind as, as you guys were talking. Because I can imagine somebody who, you know, is not as ingrained in all of this as as we are and and even i like okay i don't you know there are working gr groups under the chaos project umbrella that you know i don't uh, you know uh not that i don't have a passion to attend those meetings just that you know they don't sit, fit in my schedule for some reason or another and it, i'm like wow i i don't really know you know i i i have less of an idea of what what's you know, a beat on, you know, this group or that group or what have you, right? Imagine somebody who's completely new coming into this and like, where do I even start? Yeah, I think that's where we're, I think that question is where we're at. Um, so I, I really like this. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Uh, I've got kind of an idea here that's that stemmed from Work with, working with IEEE SA Open, they have a meeting. Um, their community advisory advisory group meetings have a check in with every subgroup of that community advisory group, and then the people check in say like a, within a few minutes or even less what's going on in that group and what they're working towards. And I think that's a really really good idea. Um, we might even want to have something like that in our main meeting. Would that help capture what some of these stories might be, Matt? Uh, I think, I, I guess I'm thinking more general onboarding of like, what is the Chaos Project doing and how do I get involved? <laughs> like, what am I most interested in and, and how do I know? I, I guess we have this, uh follow up from every working group on our uh, monthly meeting, like first Monday meeting where every group shares their stories or what, uh, whatever the progress they are doing. Maybe we can structure or like customize it, like uh, how to bring some scenarios in those things like, okay, a uh, particular working group might look at, okay, we looked at this scenario and we can think of these as a sharing with the community that these are the few metrics we can use as a particular scenario from a group perspective. I think we, uh, I think we need to be really, really careful about how we come up with these user stories and, uh, and how we present them. The, the problem I've had with the language of user stories in the past is uh, user stories, uh, it's a matter of perspective. User stories are usually used by people who are designing something to describe like what they're designing it for. Uh, alternatively, we could look at it as requirements gathering if, if, we, if we're talking about design. And in requirements gathering, we're grabbing those user stories from the community. Uh, so there, there's a couple different ways that we can think about these, these stories and scenarios. And I think we need to be really careful that we understand which perspective we are, uh, we are using to craft them. Uh, so if we're, if we're coming up with these stories ourselves based on how we're building these metrics, then there is a, there is a validity issue, right? We're telling people how we think these metrics can be used. Uh, but 
they're not necessarily connected to the community itself. So listening to your talk, maybe it's a proposal for a chaos that we should uh, do a research and reach out to people uh, to understand what are their stories that we can bring to the chaos as a community. And because our goal is to help the different communities to assess their health or sustainability of their project and going forward. But until unless we don't have their stories, how, how we can, like, we can assume, okay, we are observing these things, but bringing those stories. So I think it's a research proposal for a chaos as a community to reach out to the people to understand what are their pain points. I think, I think all of the activities we've discussed are good. I just, I just want to be, I think we just need to be careful how we characterize these. So we, everything that's been talked about sounds great. Just, uh, just be really careful about how we present these user stories and what we say they are, right? Based on, based on how we've uh, collected and, and connected the data together. And also you gotta remember that we, we all have to remember too, including me, <laughs> this stemmed from how do we get people started with the project and how do we get people in a space where they're comfortable with the metrics of the chaos project? Uh, it sounds like onboarding to me. Um, and the user stories are an idea. There are also a lot of other ideas. Uh, I think learning paths is also great in, in respect to how do we get, what's someone's starting point with the Chaos Project? For the longest time, it's been the participate page, but we've had some ways that the participate page can rub people the wrong way or not give them enough direction. Um, so I, I just think that, that that beginning point is like the most crucial like way to, determine if so like for, for someone to determine if they want to work with the chaos project or not. So I think that's really important to, to, to pay mind to. Um, I, I would be happy to participate in a project to research user stories, although I don't think I should lead it because I'm so new here. I, I feel like I could add as somebody who, who's new to all of this, um, it seems a little bit meta for me to be speaking now, but having recently tried to figure out what the chaos community was all about, I know like when I went to the project or the participate page, I didn't scroll down far enough at first to realize that that was where all of the good information was. But it just, it took me quite a few days to kind of get a sense of what's going on, how you know, the sense of how welcoming is, how, just how much documentation all of these committees, as well as, um, to, well, the phrase to, if you want to be a duck, you got to learn to quack like a duck. Uh, it, it, I, I was tr just trying to figure out like, ooh, values committee, that seems interesting. Ooh, you know, um, um, diversity, that seems like just, there's there were a lot of new uh, phrases and terms and, for me, as a developer, part of a really big project, you know, the question I came with was, we've been measuring all of this stuff in the Drupal community for over five years now, and I was think I was starting to think, oh my gosh, are we measuring the right stuff? So I'm going through all of the metrics and whatnot. So I think, just from that point that point of view, I feel like um, helping funnel people into the right groups, um, or just I, I don't even know how you solve that of trying the, the language barrier of of just the metrics community. This is very helpful. So thank you. Um, Matthew, as a as a new contributor, if you do uh, if you do have ideas on uh, some high level thoughts on on things to address that participate page, uh, I'd, I'd love it if you could open an issue. Uh, to share your thoughts on, on the website repository. Sure, in Git in GitLab or GitHub. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you have time. So 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 that's a, a good example. Like, um, is is that would I open that with the common? Uh, is it the common group that we're in now? Um, or... I just posted the repository link in the chat as well. Okay. Oh, the website group. Okay, got it. Yeah, so that that would be the web content group. So it's not a it's not a metrics working group. Gotcha. 
Uh, it's just the, it's the group that, uh, that manages the website. Maybe we should have a, a like a dedicated team that focuses on onboarding and kind of uh, distilling these. Oh, thanks, Matt Snell. I got two thumbs up on that. Yes. Um, I think that would be important just to have like a deliberate focus. People, you know, it's kind of one of those things if nobody owns, if everybody owns it, nobody owns it kind of a thing. So I would like to see that if that's something we feel like we should do. I think, I think some describing some ways that some goals and questions that we've encountered from folks in different working groups and how we've gone about <clears throat> working together to answer them, you know, taking the metrics from concept and definition to some kind of presentation that that's useful to people. I think we have a lot of examples of that in the, in the tools that we have. So somehow I think they could be useful for telling, helping to tell these stories and helping people see what kind of information can you be presented with about a repository or a collection of repositories. So not to draw this out, I think there's, I honestly think there's kind of two conversations going on here. So one is about onboarding. So how do we help people be participants in the chaos project? Mm -hmm. And they may be related. And then the other is these user scenarios or learning paths, which is how do we draw together otherwise atomic metrics in meaningful ways that like might help a community manager, or community organizer help get a better understand of understanding of, of community growth. Right. Their own okay. community growth. And we we they could live together, but and so to me, the user scenarios or learning paths are, if you wanna get a better understanding of say contributor experience, here are the metrics that could be helpful for you. And then to Sophia's earlier point, here are the data sources that could be useful to you when you're trying to understand contributor experience. And then maybe to Matthew and Matt's point, um, like if you're interested in knowing more, here are the working groups that where we talk about these particular metrics. Like that could be a, a funnel to get so people think, to the right locations. And I think I think the second one is one that so you get someone clicks, finds chaos, and they're chaos curious, and they come to our website and try to understand what the value proposition is beyond defined metrics which i think is pretty transparent if i think the second point you made about the scenarios and showing examples that moves the chaos curious to sort of past curious to possibly interested and then at that point we want to see if there's a way that we can help shepherd new contributors who are interested into the project i i have some concern right now that people don't perhaps fully understand all of the things that are enabled through the chaos project when they come to our page. So if they're curious, it's a lot of information that's overwhelming and they may not persist to understand it, that that's the first obstacle. And then onboarding is the second obstacle. That's uh, my theory. I, I agree that there, there's, a, there's a lot of complexity in the chaos project. So all the different working groups, some of the working groups define metrics, some of the working groups do other things, and then we have two pieces of software that are being created also. Uh, so that there's a lot of complexity. It is, it's, if you're new to the project and you're trying to figure out where to participate, that is, it can be difficult. Uh, but I, uh, I do agree with Matt, the, I think the user scenarios is a different thing. Yeah. And, I, and I actually think the user scenarios are, I think that's part of our, our core mission the metrics definition, and I view it as kind of a, a categorization or way of collecting these metrics together that uh, that that help define them and and uh, provide descriptions of, of how to use them. So I, I think user scenarios are part of our, our core function. Okay. Did um, you, yeah. 
Yeah. Totally. I was just itching to talk. <laughs> yeah. So um uh something I wanted to okay, there are three things. I hope I don't forget them all. So the first thing is I totally agree that like you know for a newcomer navigating the site and understanding working groups, right? It's like pretty difficult because I've had um up to three calls, like people, um, people from my network trying to contribute to chaos. And I had to, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, have a call with them and look at all the working groups on the site. And trust me, I also found it difficult finding some things, right? Even if I've been with chaos for a while. And then um, the se second thing I wanted to say is, we could start off by, you know, recognizing um, new contributors on weekly calls, right? So um, let's say um, you see someone who maybe you've not, uh, the person hasn't joined this call before and be like, okay, if you are available to, if you can uh, introduce yourself and, you know, tell us uh, why um, you are, not necessarily why that might sound rude, but um, how you got involved, how you want to get involved with chaos, right? Um, then uh, a third thing I wanted to mention is, so this this might be long term, but we can introduce um, maybe monthly um, newcomer call that newcomer calls that you know people wanting to get involved with chaos can you know we do like a demo and you know introduce them to different working groups and you know because i think um, there was a time where somebody wanted to um contribute to chaos and i think um he he was attending a different meeting from what he wanted to do right so I, th I think that's that's what um one of um, the three things i wanted to like point out we could you know plan long term for a monthly call it, it, it would really be helpful totally thank you Ruth. that those are three really good point one good point and two really great ideas yeah i really like the idea of having like a newcomer call that people can just join and and learn more about the project i mean you could even you could even run those as kind of like office hours where anybody could drop in and ask sort of random random questions and it's you know anything's free game there's no bad questions kind of model they return office hours return yeah. which is cool <laughs> so i don't know if this is I don't know if this is true. Um, I mean, I, I think I wrote a bullet point somewhere in the doc. Um, I wonder if like people come to our website or our repo and look for, like they wanna measure some aspects of the community and we're just not addressing it. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that for sure. Cause I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about over the, I mean, I don't know how long is I think we've done a good job of capturing like contributions or activities on repos, but outside of that, I'm not sure if we're necessarily addressing a lot of the like needs or requirements from, from community managers. So like the scenario, somebody's like, I, will, I want to get a better understanding of fill in the blank, whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, like, you know, people started a discussion on, on forums right, or, or whatever channels that people are using for communications. Uh, it's not code, but people are starting conversations and starting topics like we're, um, you know, and that's could be just as, I mean, as valuable as contributions on the repo. And if we're not addressing those and, you know, maybe people sort of lose interest and drop off. And those are harder to measure, right? I mean, you can argue that like activities on repos, like you don't even need like to use, you can just use get the metrics from, from GitHub or GitLab uh, without having to use any of the, you know, metrics that, that we define in chaos, but other contributions are harder to measure uh, depending on what tools you're using. 
but I mean, that's just a comment. I I have no idea if that's the case. So I'm I'm just trying to make sense of limited data we have from the Twitter poll. So the scenario, what would the scenario be, Ray? Like, so somebody is like, I want to understand something, whatever it might be. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like doing this, for example, in my current community, I'm doing this a lot of times manually and I'm working with some companies to see if we can automate this. Uh, we have a Slack channel for our community and people post a lot of questions like I'm trying to do X, Y, Z and I'm stuck. And there are a lot of people that are really good at like jumping in and answering those questions. And and I'm sure there's a way to sort of like account those. Like I'm, I mean, that's, I'm working with some of the outside uh, organizations to help help us do that, but you know, I I like to be able to sort of recognize these people, like I do with people that are submitting code patches on on GitHub or or whatever repo you're using, right? I mean, this person is like really helpful, like jumping on and helping, like onboard other people. Uh, gotcha. And okay. um, that's an example, and then yeah. And it could be Slack, Discourse, or whatever tool that you're using in your community. Yeah, I think we have a very diffuse way of introducing people to the projects. And so, if, like a general area to, I, I think the mailing list maybe is intended as the general area to ask a question or get to know the project, but it's not as fluid and dynamic as like a, a discussion forum, like a Discuss or a Slack would be. So I'm agreeing with you sharing that curiosity, Ray. Yeah, when you were when you were talking about that, I just I kept thinking about the uh, the to do group Slack channel. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just listening. I think there are two approaches to helping people come to chaos. One is we think about what structure they would expect and that would make sense to them to make it more intuitive um, because the structure that has grown over the last four years made sense as we were building on, but maybe we need to restructure the chaos project. And the other approach is to educate and explain how this project is structured and works. And so maybe having an explainer video on the website. Here's 90 seconds about what you need to know about chaos and where to find stuff. I will, uh, now that my semester is over-ish, I'd like to, I think office hours are a good idea. And I would offer to even do it, like just sit in a Zoom channel for, an hour every two weeks. I mean, it's not a ton of effort, you know, with and we, like, no, we have to make sure there's no agenda. Like, <laughs> like people can literally just show up and ask questions. And then, um, gosh, I mean, it really seems like a Slack channel is the way to go, like a newcomer, chaos newcomer Slack channel or something like that. I, we I have think an so. IRC channel, but. Yeah, I, th I think a Slack channel or something, yeah, something like that is the way to go as well. Only because, like, I think the office hours could be potentially helpful as well. What I find is that in office hours, you can only address one person's questions at a time. It's a very single threaded interaction. And with Slack or something like it, you can have multiple people having multiple interactions at the same time on different threads. Let's you help more people. Does that sound like a, a silly question, maybe, but do we have a Slack for chaos? No. Oh, okay. Because okay. you were talking about we creating do. a new we channel, do. and I was we, like, do we even have this? And if so, do. why am I not on? We it? do. We do, but it's not, it's been used for badging, especially when in the starting up phases. So it's not necessarily structured, but it could be, it could be used for whatever. It's, it's a chaos Slack. So, uh, I'll hand that off to whoever wants it in the in the board. Just make a newcomer channel. Yeah, so, okay. Sounds good. 
and the I, thing, and I, the thing oh, I like on. about having a Slack channel or, um, or office hours is I think some people are intimidated by mailing lists. So first of all, a lot of people aren't really that into email, but with a mailing list, I don't know whether I'm emailing five people or 50,000 people. Right. Um, whereas Agreed. if you pop into an office hours, it's like a couple of people, you can hang out, you can have a chat. If it's a Slack channel, I can see how many people are in it. And I think it just, it provides a little more, I think, context for, for newcomers. And uh, I, I do like the idea of having a Slack channel at this time as well. However, I do want to point out that uh, since chaos has begun, the idea of using a, a Slack channel or discourse or it, it's come up multiple times. And for some reason, we've always decided not to do it. So we may want to reflect on the reasons why we didn't want to do it prior. <laughs> I think we're at a different point in our own evolution, would be my short thought. And I think we had a lot of discussions about whether or not to start to spin up a discourse, which um, I'll admit I've been on the anti-discourse side because I, I think you need to pick one or the other. You need to have a forum or you need to have a mailing list. If you try to do both of them, you end up with fragmented conversations. There are mailing list people, there are forum people. And you get some of that fragmentation in, in Slack as well, but because it's sort of real time, it feels a little bit different to me. I guess I guess I would be okay with a with a Slack, whereas I think if we spun up a Discord, we would need to spin down the mailing list or make some hard decisions that way. That's just my my opinion. Don, did you say Discord or Discourse? Like yeah, and I don't uh sorry, I, mean, I, I, meant, I meant the forum one, <laughs> not the one I used. Oh, okay, to. Discourse. Okay. Yeah. I mean yeah. I I I tend to agree like we I my because I just went through this in our community you I think you're better off starting with slack because it's easier to spin up and it's more casual this course is for more like a knowledge base is it's a knowledge sharing thing it's it's not a real-time communication tool that's what slack is for and uh so you know if I, there's no sense in starting both of them just start with slack That'd be my recommendation. And if you want, like uh, to, uh, John O. Bacon, I'll try to find a, find his blog post on what both tools are for. And it was pretty concise and I thought it was well done. But Slack is more for more casual conversations. I, I think that's what we need. Like the discourse is more, I mean, that's, that's building a community knowledge base basically. I don't know if we need that right now. So can I make one comment, Elizabeth? Yes, I guess. Please. <laughs> so, uh, so I will, again, I'll offer to pilot a Slack channel and a newcomer like a Zoom or uh, like office hours Zoom over the course of summer-ish, you know, maybe for the next two months. And yeah. we can see how it goes, right? Like if we run the office hours on Zoom and nobody ever comes, then obviously we don't need to do that but if yeah. it's a great you know we get a bunch of conversations in there awesome and i can just report that back just see how it works yeah uh, i think if you create the slack channel the one thing to do would be to make it something that's linked on our website fairly clearly and then many of us can join the slack channel and be responders as well Okay, I'm, oh, go ahead, Matthew. I was just going to say, we use that concept in the Drupal community as well with the office hours and lots of people just show up and they become contributors and it seems like it's worked for us for many years. I, I'm more you of do like- that a, monthly or weekly? Weekly, um, if not more. It keeps changing. There's a whole team of people that work on it now. Yeah. Um, I, I, it might even be more than that more than weekly now, but I'm not sure. Um, I was just going to say that, that, that has whole, that whole thing has grown as like a team and it, it allows people to just come in and get pointed to the right person. Like even in a massive, big open source software project, it still often comes down to like, oh, you need to go talk to this person. Um, and I think that can be super helpful if there are, if that person to talk to uh, can help sort of guide the journey for whatever that might be. Because, I mean, I actually don't, 
I don't look at your website and or your or I don't look at the chaos community website and see, see it as like a problem the way it is. I actually think it's really well structured uh, in terms of finding things, but sometimes just that initial like human interaction in a sense, even though it might be on a, a channel can be tremendously helpful to like there's I mean, I work with a lot of UX people that know a lot more about this than I do that funnel people in. So I, I'm not an expert, but I tend to be more like that, that just ask somebody can be really helpful if there is a friendly place to do that. Is that pretty prominent on your website, the Slack channel or the office hours so that people that are first coming to it can find it or see it easily? I believe so. Um, I, I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, I can double check on uh, um, just a, just a curious I mean, just a curiosity since you have a, a lot of UX expertise. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say thank you. Thank you for the uh, the comments and thank you everyone for the the discussion on this. Uh, real quick bef before we move on because I know the meeting is going to be ending here pretty shortly. I just wanted to say that in regards to all of this the conversation we've been having about uh, contributing and participating. Uh, content on the website and in our community handbook is is actively maintained by the community. So if anyone would like to to go and help create this content and and move some of these uh, these conversations we're having, the the contributing guide would be in the governance repo, and then the website repo is is uh, is also maintained by the community. So these are these are places where we are actively doing these things that we've been talking about. Uh, and if you're interested in contributing to that, please uh, please go there and help out. Okay, I'm gonna jump in. Um, sorry. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you everyone for that amazing, awesome conversation. So many good ideas. I'm super excited to work on some of these. Um, Matt, I will help you with office hours and Slack and all of those things. We can take that offline though. Um, just real quick, um, no Asia Pacific call next week. Resuming that on May 19th, as you see in the meeting. Also, Matt Snell, where are you? Are you still here? You are. I'm here. Um, Matt Snell is taking some time off. So if you have concerns or questions about the DEI badging program while he's, uh, while he's gone, there is a team of us that are covering for him. Um, Matt, do you want to add anything to that? I'm on that team, so you can. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, um, Asa, Ruth. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Thank you, Asa, Ruth, Anita, and you, Elizabeth. I think we have a couple more people that are interested as well that may be onboarding before I leave too. Um, but I'm going to be gone for the month of May and I'll, uh, just a quick note, thank you everybody um, for everything in the badging project so far. Really excited to see how it is when I come back too, uh, as long as it's not on fire. Um, and I, I will be coming back as uh, Matt can too to anyone that might need to know about the name change too. So uh, that's all I have. Thank, thank you, you Matt. And then um, I see one other thing that Ruth has posted in here. Uh, there's a badging CFP abstract. Looks like Ruth's looking for some feedback on that. If you have time to do that, that yeah. would be super helpful. Just, if, if it's just two minutes. <laughs> yeah. I think that All Things Open is due on Friday. So it'd be sooner than later would be appreciated. Correct. Um, anything else super quick? All right. Thank you everyone for coming and we will see you next week. Take care, everybody. See ya. Yeah. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye.